Hey everybody, Eric Grenier here and welcome to the 20th episode of The Writ Podcast. A little mini milestone there. Later I'll be joined by Teresa Wright to discuss the state of politics in Prince Edward Island. But first let's get you up to date on the elections that were held across Quebec this past Sunday. The province held its municipal votes for mayor and city councils. And one of the bigger surprises was how easily Valérie Plante defeated Denis Cadère in the race to be Montreal's mayor. Plante beat Cadère back in 2017 by a margin of just under six percentage points. But on Sunday, she took 52% of the vote, up a little bit since 2017, while Cadère dropped about eight points to 38%. Ballarama Holness, who got some attention for proposing Montreal become an officially bilingual city, took 7% of the vote. The polls suggested it was going to be a lot closer than this. The final polls by Leger and Main Street gave Plante a lead of about five or six points, so this was a bit of a miss, but the polls did suggest that Plante was picking up some late campaign momentum after she trailed Kader in earlier polling, so that momentum might have been carried through to Election Day. In Quebec's second biggest city, Quebec City, Bruno Marchand narrowly beat out Marie-Josée Savard with 32.3% to 31.9% of the vote. Jean-François Gosselin came third with 25%. The final Léger poll here was actually very close. It had Marchand and Savard tied at 31% and was exactly right with Gosselin. Two other wins I want to point out. In Rimouski, in eastern Quebec, Guy Caron won with 81% of the vote. If that name is familiar, it's because Guy Caron was an NDP MP from 2011 to 2019 and ran unsuccessfully for the NDP leadership in 2017. In Longueuil, Catherine Fournier made the jump from provincial to municipal politics, easily winning the mayor's race, but she was an MNA. So that means there will now be a by-election in the Quebec riding of Marie-Victorin, probably early in the new year. Now, this has historically been a very safe seat for the Parti Québécois, but Fournier only won it by about 700 votes in 2018, so it isn't a lock for the PQ. The question now is if Paul St. Pierre Plamondon will run as he leads the PQ without a seat in the National Assembly. Something to keep an eye on ahead of next year's provincial election, the PQ needs a boost, but if St. Pierre Plamondon lost, that would be bad news for the party. It would also probably be bad news for the Quebec Liberals, who could use a stronger PQ to pull away some of the CAC's nationalist francophone vote. Over in Nova Scotia, NDP leader Gary Burrell has announced he will be stepping aside. He's been leader of the party since 2016. The Nova Scotia NDP took 21% of the vote in both 2017 and 2021 elections under his leadership, but only won seven and six seats in those campaigns. Burrell will be staying on as leader until his replacement is chosen sometime in the next year. And in Ontario, Randy Hillier who sits as an independent in Queen's Park, but was elected as a PC back in 2018, announced that he would be leading the Ontario First Party in next spring's provincial election. He's calling it the People's Party's provincial affiliate and talked about a purple wave coming to Ontario. It's not exactly clear how official all this is, but Hillier has been a pretty outspoken anti-vaxxer and anti-lockdown MPP as an independent. His won't be the only right-wing alternative on the ballot in Ontario. The New Blue Party, started by Jim Carajalios, who was not allowed to run for the federal conservative leadership back in 2020, will also be mounting a campaign. With the rise of the PPC during the federal campaign, these two new parties in Ontario, the Quebec Conservatives, the Buffalo Party in Saskatchewan, the Maverick Party, the Wild Rose Independence Party placing third in Alberta polls, there definitely seems to be a splintering of the right going on in Canada, accelerated by the pandemic. The splintering hasn't really had a significant electoral impact just yet, but I'm sure a lot of people looked at the Reform Party's 1988 performance, where they got 2% of the vote nationally and just 15% in Alberta, as nothing to worry about. On Monday, voters in the Prince Edward Island riding of Cornwall Meadowbank will be heading to the polls to vote in the first by-election across the country that is being caused by the results of the September federal election. Heath MacDonald was successful in his bid to become the Liberal MP from Alpec, but his federal victory meant a provincial vacancy in his old riding. It's a provincial Liberal stronghold, but the PEI Liberals are third in the legislature and without a permanent leader, and are facing both the popular government in Dennis King's PCs and a relatively popular opposition in the Greens under Peter Bevan Baker. To help break down the stakes of this by-election, and to give us an update on the state of politics in Prince Edward Island, I'm joined today by Teresa Wright. Teresa is a journalism instructor at Holland College in Charlottetown, and has covered PI politics for the Guardian newspaper and federal politics for the Canadian press. Teresa, thanks so much for joining me. Well, thank you for having me. So uh, before we get into the by-election itself, it's been a little over two years since Dennis King and the PCs, they won a minority government, they ended up 
turning it into a majority government after another by-election there. But what's your assessment of how the government has been doing over the last two years and how Islanders feel the government has been doing? Well, you know, I think that the the Dennis King government was sort of just getting its feet underneath underneath itself when the pandemic hit. So um, I think as largely this this government's um, work and its um, the, the initiatives and so on that that have come from it are, are have been defined by COVID-19 and the response that has been has been necessary uh, in that regard. So it's uh, at, at this point, I mean, if you look at recent polls, um, it would suggest that, you know, that people are fairly happy with uh, how the, the pro uh, progressive conservative government's doing, um, how they're, they're feeling satisfied uh, so far, if you look at satisfaction levels. Um, but it's also important to point out that there's uh, the opposition parties are uh, not not all of them are quite in a position to really kind of challenge them or haven't really been doing that. And I think part of that is because of the pandemic response. It's been sort of this all hands on deck. Everyone wants to do the best thing for all, all uh, residents. So there hasn't been a huge, um, you know, sort of critical element uh, when it comes to the opposition parties. So I feel as though, you know, things are going, have been going really smoothly, uh, you know, except for the whole pandemic situation. But in terms of the po politics side of things, things have been pretty smooth for the, the Dennis King government. But I, I wonder if they just haven't really ha had that challenge yet that would really kind of start to maybe uh, affect those numbers a little bit more. Do you think that now that the pandemic is, you know, sort of going in the rearview mirror, let's hope, uh, you know, we've said this all before, do you think that the next, you know, phase of this government, which, you know, the next election is now uh, less than two years away, I guess, or is it, be, yeah, two years, um, are we going to start seeing more of what the government would have been doing if it hadn't been sort of sidetracked by the pandemic uh, for a big chunk of its own mandate? Well, I, I think that's what they're trying to do right now. Um, they just came out with a capital budget um, a, couple, a week or two ago, um, kind of looking, trying to kind of deal with some of the, the issues that have been boiling up now that we're not having to deal so much with the, the COVID-19 response, especially here in PEI. The cases have remained extremely low compared to the rest of the country. We've had no deaths um, and only two hospitalizations in, the, in you know, all of the 21 months. So we've been very fortunate. And I think that that's allowed um, the, pro the provincial government to kind of start to look at some of the, the other stressors that they have to kind of take care of. And, and some of those are really starting to, to kind of Career up right now, healthcare being a really big one, housing being another. Um, so I think that what you're you're going to start seeing, and what we are seeing right now, is sort of that return to focusing on more normal political uh, issues. Uh, and and I think that that it will be the true test for this government moving forward as they start to kind of not have to necessarily be in emergency mode anymore. So the PCs are one of three PC governments uh, in Atlanta, Canada. But to give some people some context, how would you like, where would you fit the PI PC government in the quote unquote conservative governments across the country? Well, Dennis King, uh, the, the premier, has been pretty careful to uh, keep a fairly big distance between himself and the federal progressive or sorry not progressive the federal conservative party of canada especially during the federal election you didn't see um aaron o'toole doing a whole lot here in pei he did come but you know you didn't see dennis king kind of doing any um campaigning on behalf of that that party um and even with the other provincial uh leaders i mean you don't you don't hear them, you know, about them talking or collaborating a lot. Um, it really, the, the PC government in PEI, and it, ha it has long been the case, so the PC party and the Liberal Party uh, here are very similar. And if you looked at the last provincial election, if you looked at the policies that they were running on, their platforms, it was almost identical. It was, it's really just a matter of whether it was team red or team blue. And it, and it's, um, the ideologies are, are not that far off. And so, you know, they're a very progressive conservative government <laughs> emphasis on the progressive. Well, you mentioned team red or team blue, but, uh, since the last election, it's, you know, the, now there's another color, uh, you know, in the legislature in the greens, uh, who had the official opposition breakthrough in the last campaign. We saw that in the federal campaign in 2019, the uh, Greens did really well. I think PI was the best province for the federal Green Party in 2019, but their vote really dropped 
uh, across the island. I think there was less than half of the vote they got in um, 2019. Does this have any impact uh, on the Greens under Peter Bevan Baker, or is it very much limited to the federal field? I think that the provincial Green Party is hoping that it's limited to the 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 you know the the result that we saw here in PEI in the federal election that it won't affect them provincially. Um, and I'll be really interested to see um, what happens in the next couple of months because, as I mentioned, you know, moving away from that, you know, everyone trying to just support the government and and everyone being on the same page, I think that's affected how people are viewing political polls. But, you know, as we inch closer to a provincial election, things are going to start to get more interesting on that side. And I mean, I think the Green Party provincially has been really careful to try to, again, keep that separation between itself and the federal party, uh, which I think is surprising, given the fact that they are really um, this is where they have the largest amount of support. I'm surprised that the federal party hasn't taken issue with that more, to be honest. Um, but I think it'll be really interesting to see. It, it, it will really depend on what happens, I think, when and whenever the, the Liberal Party decides to have a leadership contest and who takes over for that and what happens there. Because really the Green Party's support uh, came and, and the fact that they broke through as the opposition party really came as a result of the collapse of the Liberal vote here in PEI. And so until there is real movement or momentum or anything happening on that side, which right now there isn't, um, then I think there's sort of a holding pattern. And again, I'm not trying to suggest that that the Green Party doesn't have support. They obviously do here. But I, I don't, again, I don't know that they're being challenged for that support in any way at this point. So it's it's really hard to tell what, what could change when we start to get closer to an actual election. Yeah, you, you mentioned the Liberals. Uh, you know, the polls do generally have the Greens in second and, and the Liberals in third. They haven't named a leader yet since uh, Wade McLaughlin stepped down after the last campaign. What's going on there? Because it has been quite a while. This is starting to get to the point where it's been a long time for the party not to have a permanent leader in place. Yeah, it's a good question. What is happening? Um, they've, <laughs> they've, uh, there was a date that was said it was supposed to be, there was going to be a liberal leadership convention, I think in two days from now originally, but they called that off uh, when Dennis King um, committed uh, in uh, in the CBC to, to to keep to PEI's fixed election date, so not to call an early election. Uh, so essentially, they're like, "Oh, we have more time, so we're gonna not move forward." Probably because they didn't have candidates that they really hoped would be uh, good challengers for this this uh, for the government right now. But you know, it's it's not the first time I've seen this happen in PEI, where after a government has been in power for over ten years because that tends to be what happens in PEI. We elect governments for a long period of time, and then we kind of throw them out for a long period of time. And so it, there's like sort of this gap several years where it's hard to find uh, a, a leader of the party who has lost the government. So the Liberals were in power for 12 years. Anybody who takes over as leader right now will have to be in that job for a while. Uh, and it's, you know, and to be the third party leader, it's that's a hard job and it's it's not necessarily the one that they're going to get the most attractive candidates for at least that's obviously the, the gamble that they're making right now so it's uh it's interesting that they there doesn't seem to be anybody you know raising their hand for this job uh <laughs> but i think it kind of tells you where where the party's at right now in pei which you know it's again it's happened before but as we start to get closer to a provincial election or maybe even the next election after that then i think that's when you'll start to see things change a lot more here so for the liberals i guess the next test will just be on monday in that by-election in cornwall meadowbank uh this was a riding that was vacated by heath mcdonald who ran successfully for the federal liberals and it also has been a seat uh, since, uh, where did I put my notes? I think it was from 1986 or something like that. That, that. There was that one election where the Liberals were reduced to a single seat, and it was this area that still stuck with the Liberals. Uh, yeah. So what do you think are the stakes in this by-election? Well, I think most by-elections are usually a sort of a mini referendum on the government in power. Um, and the, the 
conservatives here have had two by-elections. One of them was a deferred election um, because uh, one of the Green Party candidates in the last provincial election passed away just a few days before um, the, the election, and they had a second one, and, and um, they easily won that one. So, I mean, I think if they don't easily win this one, uh, it will be very surprising to me, given that we don't seem to have that a lot of, of uh, you know, organic concern coming necessarily from from islanders. Um, and and at, th at this point, you know, when people are trying to look at what is the best way to move forward um, post COVID, uh, I think trying to elect someone who might end up in government um, might be how islanders are going to look at this rather than electing someone into opposition, which is what the Green Party is hoping for. So this could be like an election where you, there is a big swing from the last general that it doesn't really look like that, that the PCs can come from third and, and just move ahead because of that appeal of being in government, you think? I Yeah, I think that that's a big part of it. I mean, it, it is something... So there is something to be said about the fact that Cornwall Meadowbank has been a, a liberal stronghold for, well, since, from what I understand, it was since they stopped having two, electing two uh, uh, MLAs to the legislature. They weren't called MLAs. One was called a councillor, one was called an assemblyman. We had a totally different electoral system um, in until the 90s. Um, and it's been a liberal seat, you know, ever since, um, and, and before that too. Uh, but I think in, in many cases, and in most case, like there was one person who had that seat for most of that time, Ronnie McKinley, and he was just sort of a, a personal, very personally popular in that area uh, and um, a much beloved political figure here. So it's it was more personality based, I think, in that case than political, but still um, it'll be uh, it'll be a coup for the progressive conservative government to get that seat um, after so many years of it being read. But um, I, I will be surprised if they don't win it, just given the sort of the different dynamics that are going on in PEI politics right now. Do you think there'll be any repercussions for either the Greens, for example, if the Greens aren't very competitive or if the Liberals do actually you know, lose this seat and maybe even let's say they fall into third or something like that in a seat that used to be one that was safe for them? Do you think there'd be any fallout from it or is everybody just going to shrug it off and move on? I think the biggest fallout would be for the Green Party it, because it might you know, show Islanders, it, it might sort of get them starting to question whether that that green vote is softening here and what that could mean going forward. So I really think that, you know, the, the Liberals at this point, they don't have a leader there. There's not even anybody who's said they want to be the leader. They don't have a leadership convention date. Uh, if they lose this seat, I don't think that they um, that that it will be a huge shock for them. Um, but, uh, but I do, but they were really trying to kind of, um, show themselves as contenders. I, I will say they, they, um, had a, a, comp a, a big competition for the nomination, which, um, the PC party did not have, uh, they had an acclaimed candidate. There was five people running for the liberal nomination, uh, in this district. So essentially I, I think it's, it's really going to be down to, you know, Islanders deciding how they feel about the PC government. And if you look at the the most recent polls, it's really theirs to to lose. Yeah, well, uh, it'll be an interesting one to see what's going to happen because, as you say, I think you know the opposition parties. It'll be fascinating to see what fallout there'll be from that because you know you mentioned the Liberals not having high expectations. If they have a really good performance, maybe suddenly people think, hey, maybe I do want to lead this party. <laughs> well, <laughs> or yeah. as if they fall really fall behind, maybe it just extends this sort of lack of enthusiasm. Yeah, yeah, that's true, which is probably why they're they're trying to be very competitive and they have a very credible candidate. Um, all the candidates who are running are, are very credible, very, um, you know, have have strong backgrounds uh, in, in the fields that they're coming from. Uh, I wouldn't say that any of these candidates are sort of names on ballots, which you can sometimes see in, in by elections, you know, in, you know, in between, especially after a big swing or a big change uh, in government. Um, so it, it is interesting. Um, but one of the things I do think too, um, the last poll that we received, we don't get a lot of polls uh, on just PEI politics, just given our size. Um, it did show, you know, strong satisfaction rates and, and polling numbers for the PC government. But a lot of things have happened since then that that have um, has kind of 
been challenging for them that they've they've really had trouble with, including um, challenges on healthcare, uh, which is region wide. You know, doctor shortages everywhere, uh, and shortages of all kinds of medical professionals, uh, in, in part because of burnout from the pandemic, and then housing, just a huge huge um, issue here. And the PC government has really kind of struggled to uh, to address some of the concerns uh, that have been coming forward. Uh, so. Uh, you know, it'll be interesting if, if they, I, I mean, like I said, I, I sort of expect them to win, but maybe the margin of, of how closely that they're able to win it or not um, might give us a better indication of where things are at um, politically here in PEI. All right. Well, something to look for on Monday night. So thanks, Teresa, so much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate you taking some time to speak with us today. Well, uh, this was great. Thanks so much for having me. All right, questions and answers. Got uh, some questions on Twitter. A few of them are going to uh, try to answer. This one I got from James Twist. I'm actually not going to be able to answer it. Given the massive increase in the use of mail ballots in the recent federal election, is there any information on the number of ballots that were not returned in time to be counted? I thought this was a good question, so I did send it to Elections Canada. I only sent it a little while ago, and I haven't heard back from them yet, so stay tuned. I'll give you an answer in the next episode, and the answer could be we don't know. Jane Collins also asked, uh, who will be the new leader of the Greens? So the news we had this week was that Annamie Paul has officially resigned as Green Party leader. You know, the public announcement, I guess, wasn't an official enough resignation. And it's still not exactly clear to me if she's officially, officially resigned, but she has submitted her resignation. This is my understanding of the situation. So who will be the new leader of the Greens? That's a really good question, because going into the last one in 2020, uh, there wasn't really a anybody that was very clearly going to be the next leader of the Green Party. Annie Paul, when she ran for the leadership, was not a well-known person. She's not someone that most people who covered federal politics had heard of before. Um, And the person who finished second, which was Dimitri Lascaris, also someone who really wasn't a known quantity. Uh, There was Glenn Murray who ran. He was a former Ontario Liberal cabinet minister, mayor of Winnipeg. He ran. He was the only recognizable name, and he didn't do that well. So who's going to run this time? It could be anybody, anybody that you've not heard of exactly, if you're not very involved in green politics, could emerge as the next leader of the Green Party. Uh, But if we're just going uh, by the fact that there was just a leadership race and Dimitri Lascaris came pretty close in second place, you would think that he would have a good shot at winning the leadership if he decides to run again. I got a couple questions on uh, Quebec politics. The next election in Quebec is now less than a year away, so start that countdown. Uh, This was from uh, Gallagher. He asked, what's your take on Quebec Solidaire in the 2022 Quebec election? What would you say are their conditions to make gains? Quebec Solidaire had a bit of a breakthrough in the last campaign. They finished with 10 seats, which is many more than they used to have. They used to be able to win two, three seats. Uh, And they were able to win 10 seats, tying the Parti Québécois, and they nearly tied them as well in the popular vote with around 16%. What's going to happen in the next campaign? Well, Quebec Solidaire in the polls has been more or less holding its vote. So it has a decent shot at holding its seats that it has on the island of Montreal, because on the island of Montreal, the CEQ is not that competitive. So those seats that uh, that Quebec Solidaire won, the six seats they won on the island of Montreal, they can maybe hold on to them. And they'll be looking to make some gains, particularly on the island of Montreal, because they didn't really come a close second in any ridings outside of the island of Montreal. If you look at the map of where they finished second, it's in a lot of places where they had 15% of the vote and the CAQ had 45, 50, 55 or more. So really, it's going to be about trying to win those extra seats on the island of Montreal. The thing is, though, in those seats where they were second and competitive, there are some seats where they were second, but not very competitive. The Liberals were first. So they need to take down liberal incumbents. Uh, So they probably need a lot of the PQ vote to abandon the Parti Québécois, go to Quebec Solidaire, because the two parties are both sovereignist parties. They're both on the left wing of of the spectrum, though on issues like identity, they're not really both on the same side as much. Uh, But even in some of these writings, they'll need not only the PQ vote, they'll probably need a little bit of the liberal vote. So that's going to be a little bit of a hard one to do, that they're going to have to try to get those progressive voters that are within the Liberals, but aren't put off by the Quebec Solidaire's sovereignist positions, though it's they're relatively lighter on it than the Parti Québécois. Um, but it will be a bit of a delicate dance. But I think for Quebec Solidaire, what they're hoping is that they can be the second choice of Francophones. Because we've seen in a lot of polls that the CQ is dominant. 
But Quebec Solidaire is in the running to be the second choice of francophones because the support for the liberals has, has dropped so much. But if they're looking at making gains in this election that's coming up, they'll have to hold on to the seats that they have. And a couple of them in Ray Naranda in Western Quebec, one of their Quebec City ridings, they won two there, and the riding of Sherbrooke, they're probably going to have to hold off the CAQ, and the CAQ is looking pretty strong. So for Quebec Solidaire, I think it will be a tough election, but I think they can be more optimistic than maybe any other party. If I was the Liberals or if I was the Parti Québécois, I'd be looking at this upcoming campaign, and I'd be pretty worried about it. Continuing on uh, Quebec questions, Christopher J., what would you say would be Paul Saint-Pierre Plamondon's fate if he loses the upcoming Quebec by-election? Does it differ if he loses to the CQ versus Quebec Solidaire? You know, the next election is only, as I said, I guess now it's 11 months away. Now, I wouldn't put it past the Parti Québécois to dump a leader this close to an election. They have a history of uh, knifing their leaders and, you know, doing it just this soon before an election would not by any means be a shock. But it is a, you know, short timeline the party is not doing very well in the polls, so it's not like they're going to be getting a rush of stellar candidates for leadership. So uh, I think if Saint-Pierre uh, Saint Plamondon runs but loses, I think the the impact is going to be more political rather than to his own leadership, but we'll see. But let's say he does run and he hasn't committed to running and he loses to the CQ. I think that would probably be better because I think that's kind of expected. The CAQ is uh, the Parti Québécois' main opponent in most ridings where they're in first. And in a place like uh, the South Shore on uh, Montreal, that's a place that a CAQ stronghold. So if the PQ lost a seat there to the CAQ, it wouldn't be really that much of a shock. So it might be a bit easier to, you know, to digest. Losing to Quebec Solidaire, though, would be probably a disaster for the party because Quebec Solidaire wants to replace the Parti Québécois as the, you know, sort of left-wing uh, sovereignist party in Quebec. And if they were able to pick up a seat off the island of Montreal in the Longueuil area, uh, that would be a big signal that the Parti Québécois might be in even more trouble and that Quebec Solidaire could hoover up some of that PQ vote in lots of different parts of the province and become the alternative to the CAQ among francophones because, you know, the, the Quebec liberals are still very popular among uh, Quebec anglophones, but in a lot of polls they are in fourth in francophones. So for Quebec Solidaire, they're not in the running to form a government anytime soon, but they would love to form the official opposition. That'd be tough, but at the very least, they would like to supplant the Parti Québécois and winning a by-election like this would be uh, a good way to do it. And even if uh, Saint-Pierre Plamondon doesn't run and Quebec Solidaire wins this seat, that would be problematic. The Parti Québécois has held the seat since the 1980s. They lost it in a by-election. But before that, it was part of the riding that René Lévesque used to represent. So it would be a pretty symbolic loss if uh, the uh, Parti Québécois lost this to Quebec Solidaire. One more on Quebec. Sébastien, he asked, uh, with the provincial by-election in Marie-Victorin, what is the history of leaders' courtesy in Quebec and elsewhere? So the question is because Dominique Anglade, who is the leader of the Quebec Liberals, she offered to not run a candidate if Saint Pierre Plamondon runs in Marie -Vic Victorin, if the other party leaders all, uh, parties also don't run candidates, and it doesn't seem like that's going to happen, so it seems like the CQ and Quebec Solidaire will, will run candidates. So it looks like even if the PQ leader runs, it will be a full slate. Uh, but in terms of the leader's courtesy, I looked back on it, and in Quebec, it's actually it has a, a bit of a richer history. So there's been five cases I can identify since the 1990s. So in 2017, in the writing of Gouin. This was a Quebec Solidaire held riding, and the PQ didn't run because Gabriel Nadeau-Dubois, who is right now one of the co-spokespersons for the Quebec Solidaire, he was trying to get a seat, and the PQ didn't run against him. But the Liberals in the CEQ did. In Outremont in 2013, uh, this was Philippe Cuillard, who was trying to get a seat. He had just been named the leader of the Quebec Liberals. The PQ and the CEQ didn't run against him, but Quebec Solidaire did. In Charlevoix in 2007, this was Pauline Marois. She was trying to get a seat. She had just become leader of the Parti Québécois. The Liberals and Quebec Solidaire didn't run against her, but the ADQ did. The ADQ was the predecessor of the CAQ. And in pointe aux trembles in 2006, André Boisclair, he was trying to get a seat. He was the new PQ leader. The Liberals and the ADQ didn't run, but Quebec Solidaire did. <laughs> so what we have in these recent examples, you have... Um, cases where 
the liberals didn't respect the leader's courtesy, the CEQ didn't, and Quebec Solidaire did, didn't, while other parties did. I, I think it was circumstantial in all of these. And the one that I found that is probably the uh, most notable, it was in jean Pierre in 1996. This was Lucien Bouchard, who had stepped down as leader of the Bloc Québécois. Now he's running to become the premier of Quebec, and, and he was the premier, but uh, to take over the leadership of the Parti Québécois. Uh, the PLQ and the ADQ did not run against him, so he had a you know a, a, a clear run. There was just a lot of little fringe candidates that ran against him, and Bouchard got 95% of the vote. And still, some 25,000 people bothered to vote in this by-election, which I thought was interesting. Now, the question also asks, what's the history of it elsewhere? Well, let's just keep it to the federal politics. You know, we do see it now and then. Uh, the most recent example was back in 2002. The Liberals didn't run against Stephen Harper uh, when he had become leader of the Canadian Alliance and needed a seat, but the NDP did run against him. Um, it was also extended to Robert Mannion in 1938, who was a conservative leader. George Drew, PC leader in 1948. Robert Stanfield, 1967, a PC leader. Joe Clark in 2000, as well as Jean Chrétien in 1990, and Stockwell Day in 2000. So this courtesy has been respected uh, at the federal level often, but usually it's between the governing and the opposition party. And when it's a third party trying to get a seat, um, the other parties usually don't pay attention. Tommy Douglas, for example, he had failed to get a seat in a couple elections, and he tried to win some in by-elections in 1962, 1968, and the PCs and the Liberals did run against him. So it, it is more of a case of, I think, when it's a premier or an official opposition leader trying to get a seat. And I think that's the sticking point here, is that Saint-Pierre Plamondon leads the Parti Québécois, which is not the official opposition they're the third or fourth party in the legislature. I can't recall which they are because they tied in seats with the Quebec Solidaire. But that's the history of the leader's courtesy. And it seems in this case, there will be no courtesy given. Moving on to Saskatchewan. So there was um, a question from Donna Reed. She said, is there any polling data that supports Scott Moe's recent claim that Saskatchewanians, she asks if that is a word, and it is a word, but often you hear Scott Moe say Saskatchewan people. Anyway, um, is there anything that supports his claim that Saskatchewan would like a province more independent from Ottawa? So uh, just to get the, the quotes correct from Scott Moe, he said, Saskatchewan needs to be a nation within a nation. When the federal government implements policies that are detrimental to our province, our government will continue to stand up for Saskatchewan people. See, Saskatchewan people, not Saskatchewanians. Saskatchewanians? On Tuesday, uh, he also said he wasn't talking about separation, we are talking about being a Saskatchewan cultural identity within the nation of Canada, but being a nation within a nation. Um, so I found some polling data on this from the Enveronics Institute. They do this regular polling on more or less the Federation and how people are feeling about, about being a part of Canada. And it does seem like a lot of Saskatchewan people would agree with what Scott Moe is saying in the sense that 53% of Saskatchewan respondents said they felt their province was not treated with respect. Only Newfoundland, Labrador, Alberta, and Nunavut, this poll actually had some uh, good samples in the territories, um, those were the only places where they felt the province wasn't getting uh, a lot of respect. 65% said Saskatchewan has less influence on national decisions than it deserves. That was actually the highest in the country. So the idea of Saskatchewan having this grievance with the federal government and not being paid attention to, that is one that would be very popular. Now, in terms of separation, which Scott Moe said this is not what it's about, but just to go down that path, only 12% in this poll said Saskatchewan should separate from Canada. 76% said no. There was higher rates in Newfoundland and Labrador, 14%, British Columbia, 15%, Alberta, 21%, and Quebec, 29%. Um, so uh, the idea that Saskatchewan's hard done by, uh, I think, would get a lot of support within the province. The idea of a nation within the nation, um, that one might be a bit of a harder sell. And uh, as, as a Quebecer, I can say that uh, a nation is, is more than, than uh, having grievances with, uh, with Ottawa. And that'll be it for the podcast this week. Uh, thanks again to Teresa Wright for coming on the show. And thanks to everyone who is sending in their questions. If you aren't already a subscriber, I hope you'll consider a subscription to the red.ca to help me keep on doing the work I'm doing. And if you are a subscriber, 
thanks so much, and I really appreciate it. And by the way, if you can, please give my YouTube channel a subscription. Those subscriptions are free, but it would help me reach the next threshold that would allow me to squeeze a few more earnings from that web giant. All right. Well, that's a wrap for today. Hope you have a good weekend, and thanks for listening. <music>